Don't worry about the wicked or envy those who do wrong. For like grass, they soon fade. Like spring flowers, they soon wither. Trust in the Lord and do good. Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him, and he will help you. He will make your innocence radiate like the dawn, and the justice of your cause will shine like the noonday sun. Be still in the presence of the Lord, and wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about evil, or fret about the wicked schemes. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. I wonder if you've noticed the wonderful titles I come up with for my sermons. <laughs> and sometimes I even relate to what I preach on, eh? <laughs> Great and awesome blues. Well, I look over the congregation and I don't know if I see too many blues fans. So you know that that's not what I'm talking about. But it is February and we have part, we learn from our culture and the people that want to sell things. So if you spent a lot of money and built up the stock of Hallmark this week and the Rose Company, that's really good because I hope you gave the flowers and cards to the right people. And, and, and that's all. You think there's a mistake that they put Valentine's in the middle of the winter? I don't think so. I think somebody planned that. So, so that we would get rid of those blues, the February blues. And, but to call them great and awesome, what the, how do I get away with that? Well, it just isn't true. If you have the blues, there's nothing great and awesome about how you feel. It's a, there's different ways, and I'm going to talk about that, because in our story, these guys, these folks trying to do a job, get the blues. They get down, they get discouraged. And we get down and discouraged sometimes when someone else causes it, or sometimes it's just the weather. And, you know, it could be sunny out there today, and then I wouldn't have been able to make a comment like, oh, it's sort of dull out there today, because you never know. In Brandon, it's kind of nice sometimes in winter. I'm, I'm surprised. Yeah, this worked a lot better when I was in Kitimat, because it was almost always rainy in the wintertime there, and the summertime, <laughs> and all the time. But it's so easy to get discouraged. It, it, and you know this because you've experienced it. And the more exacting, the more precise your job is, or your, the things that you put on the list to do today, the more precise that is and the more exacting it is, the harder it is when it gets derailed. When someone interrupts, when someone says that's a useless idea, don't do that. It even hurts more when it's your boss and, you, you know, well, anyway, it's easy to get discouraged. And what comes with discouragement is fear. Fear that you're not going to be able to get it done or fear that you're useless. All those kinds of things happen. So we just, I, that's why I had uh, Patrick read from that wonderful Psalm 37. Basically, it's the don't worry, be happy psalm, eh? And isn't that what we need on mid-February to get rid of those blues? The don't worry, be happy. Now, we need to figure it out a little clearer what that means. But I want to read uh, uh, the portion of scripture for this week from Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 7 to 23. And I don't think we can see that very good. Oh, I can see it up here, so just trust me, all right? I don't think I can see it all the way back there. We'll fix this up another week. Okay, but when Sambalat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Amorites and the Ashdodites heard that the work was going ahead and that the gaps in the wall of Jerusalem were being repaired, they were furious. Remember Sambalat? I showed you a picture last week of the 
mean looking guy. Yeah, they, I figure he's, he's, the, he's the bad guy, and so are these others. And in fact, Nehemiah tells them because it tells, uses these names because they're sort of like the people that surround Jerusalem, the neighbors. They all made, this is the people I just read about in verse 8 here, they all made plans to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw us into confusion. Okay, last week they were just sort of pointing their finger and going, eh, eh, you're silly, you're not going to win. Now they're getting, cranking it up a bit, they're going to fight. This is in verse 9, this is Nehemiah writing in his journal, he says, but we prayed to our God and guarded the city day and night to protect ourselves. Then the people of Judah began to complain. Uh-oh. The workers are getting tired. And there's so much rubble to be moved. We will never be able to build the walls by ourselves. Let's get a government grant. Oh, no. That's... <laughs> I'm not supposed to do that to scripture. I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> Meanwhile, our enemies were saying, before they know what's happening, we will swoop down on them and kill them and end their work. The Jews who lived near the enemy came and told us again and again, they will come from all directions and attack us. So I placed armed guards behind the lowest parts of the wall in the exposed areas. I stationed the people to stand guard by, by families armed with swords and spears and bows. Then I looked over the situation. I called together the nobles and the rest of the people, and I said to them, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord, who is great and glorious. And fight for your brothers, your sisters, your sons and your daughters and your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard that we knew of their plans and that God had frustrated them, we all returned to our work on the wall. But from then on, only half my men worked while the other half stood guard with spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. The leaders stationed themselves behind the people of Judah who were working, building the wall. The laborers carried on their work with one hand supporting the load and one hand holding a weapon. All the builders had the swords belted to their side. Trumpeters stayed with me to sound the alarm. Then I explained to the nobles and the officials and all the people, the work is very spread out and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. When you hear the blast of the trumpet, rush to wherever it's sounding, then our God will fight for us. When we worked, we worked early and late, from sunrise to sunset, half the men were always on guard. I was also told everyone living outside the walls to stay in Jerusalem. That way, they, they and their servants could, come, could help with the guard duty at night and work during the day. During this time, none of us, not I, nor my relatives, nor my servants, nor the guards who were with me, ever took off our clothes. We carried our weapons with us at all times, even when we went for water. Wow. I'm not sure we needed that last verse. <laughs> a little bit too much information. <laughs> all right, we got the idea. Things were tense. They had reason to be discouraged. And it happens to us. And we don't want to quit. We don't want to lose the battle. As followers of Jesus, we know our task is to go out and share the gospel. We don't want to get discouraged. We want to lose the battle. We don't want to fail to produce. We don't want to have it happen that we make no disciples. We certainly don't want it to happen that we share no love. And we provide no healing or salvation just because we got suckered by discouragement and the blues. So, we need to get cranked up a little bit. And we need to learn from Nehemiah how he did it. There's all kinds of causes of discouragement, and we see this in our, our scripture. The, the loss of strength came when, in verse 10, we read that about the strength of the laborers was giving out. They were halfway there. We learned that in verse 6. And there's no other hard, harder time than being halfway there because you're only halfway there. And I, I've already told you that I used to tell 
my children, whenever they said, are we there yet? I would tell them, we're halfway there, and I figured that would work. And they caught on that it was 10 minutes after we left the house, and it was 10 minutes. I said the same thing when it was 10 minutes to get there. So they never believed me anymore about that. But it worked in terms of us understanding that we think we're just getting good, we feel like we're there, and then we realize we're only halfway. Well, these people were discouraged in that way, but it wasn't just that. They had lost this, their strength because the enemy was at them. The same people seemed to be doing all the work. The, enemy, the energy level drops, and there's a loss of strength. And when there's a loss of strength, there's discouragement. And physically, you can relate to that. If you aren't feeling good, whether it's a stomach flu or a deadly disease, or, or just when you don't feel like you can actually, you hurt too much when you do the work, you get really discouraged. When we talk about our spiritual work, boy, are we susceptible to so many different kinds of in, in, injuries and loss of strength. It's kind of simple in some ways, and, and maybe... He, for me to say it this way, well, it kind of, kind of makes us feel like, maybe I'm talking down to you, but it, it's so obvious when we talk about growing spiritually and needing to feed on the Word of God and, and uh, have the Word of God give us strength. And then we realize how few times in a given week we take on spiritual food. Now, I know some of you have got into good habits and you have your daily bread and you have your devotions and, and you choose the music that lifts you up too and all that kind of stuff so that you're being fed, but it's so easy to get out of the habit of being fed. And, well, it's a good idea. I mean, at least we get one meal if you're not discouraged in some other way when you come to church on Sunday. Maybe I'll say some words that will be spiritually feeding to you. But I understand how big that maybe is. So where are we getting our strength? Where are we getting our food? It's easy to get discouraged when we lose strength. And it's easy to lose our strength when we're not taking on God's guidance and God's strength. Another cause of discouragement is loss of vision. In verse 10 as well, they said, so much rubble. They started, instead of seeing those bricks, and, and when they started, you can just imagine, they send out the 10, 15-year-olds into the rubble pile to find a good brick to use in this place. And they, and they got half the wall going. They were really going at it. Remember how Nehemiah described outside of so-and-so's house and down the street, this group did it. They were all excited. It was the same pile. But now when they're discouraged, they don't see the potential anymore. They don't see, whoa, there's some good bricks in there. They see, oh, there's rubbles too high. There's too much junk. It's not going to work. The job is too hard. <sighs> we look at our world. We look at our city. We listen to the news for seven and a half seconds. That's all it takes to get discouraged about the job we got. It's too big. There's too much evil in this world. So we lose our vision. It's so easy to get discouraged. The task that God's called us to do becomes too much when you only look at the rubbish. We need to remember how God's used you. you need to, we need to look at, at the task and count our blessings and see the joys, the victories we have already seen, the changed lives. This room is full of stories. Every one of you has different stories. But I've heard lots of them, and they're beautiful, wonderful stories of, of God working in your lives. Let's focus on that. Let's not focus on the, on the rubble so, and lose our vision. Then there's a loss of confidence. When you lose your strength and you lose your vision, you lose your confidence too. I don't think I can do this. I don't think God could use me to change somebody's life. And in Nehemiah's case, they, the builders, they say, we can't do this. It's too hard. So they lose their confidence. They, they worked with all their hearts, verse 6 said, but now they're, they're complaining and moaning and groaning. They've lost their motivation of heart. We can't do it. 
lies. We know they can do it. We love the way Nehemiah cranks them up and gets them going. And we're on this side of the story. We say, ah, they think they can do it. Ah, I know the rest of the story. They're going to do it. But something had to change. And it happens for us too. When we lose our confidence, we need to remember that our confidence was never in us anyway. It needed to be in the Lord. And the last uh, cause of discouragement that I have in this list is the loss of security. The enemy has a plan. The enemy always had a plan. Remember the uh, Tobiah probably standing beside Sambalat and poking them and saying, huh, the foxes could knock down that wall. That's no good a wall, huh? And you remember that story, that part of the story? Well, the enemy's had this plan all along, and they're, they're just implementing a little bit by little bit. Now that it didn't work just to intimidate them, they're actually getting ready to do battle and kill some people. Uh, maybe I haven't got it across to you very clearly yet, yet, and we've still got a few weeks in Nehemiah, so if I don't get it right, uh, you don't get this idea how much a strong Jerusalem meant negatively to Sambalat and the other neighbors. This is economics, folks. They were, they, nobody goes to war without having a reason, okay? And they, and they want to get rid of the powerful Jerusalem. They don't want Nehemiah leading these people because it won't pay them. They'll lose money on this. But what happens when people lose their, their confidence and their vision and their strength, then they start fearing for their lives. They lose their security. They want to run away. We think of our church work. We think of our, our call that God has on our lives. Nothing's nicer than when you come to church and you look around, you settle down into your chair. And if you happen to be lucky one with an arms, you can sit there with your arms on the chair. And you, it feels so good because your God is in control. And you're going to hear from him today and you're going to be strengthened and well there's just nothing can get you because God is on your side that's the sense of power and security that we need to have in our Lord and build up in one another but as you folks know I don't need to go into many details here that can just be gone we get scared so quickly and when we get scared we want to run away and as sadly, we know that some people run away from God and run away from church, run away out of fear. Oh, they give it other names. I wasn't being fed, or those people are hypocrites, or I, whatever. There's lots of labels people do it, but they run away. And sadly, then they run away from one body of believers. Sometimes they'll go to another one and last a little while there. But they lose their sense of security. And it's their sense of security in God that's the problem. So, causes of discouragement. Well, let's deal with it. Let's see how Nehemiah dealt with it. The wall wasn't an easy job, and, and that might, makes this story all the better, because we know that our job that God has given us isn't an easy one either. To enter into people's lives in such a, an open and, and trusting way that they could trust us with their fears, and their spiritual life. You know, if that doesn't happen, folks, we're not going to be able to share the gospel. We can give them a track. In fact, if you get a big enough Bible, you can almost knock them over if you hit them in the head with it. You, ever, you know, some people try that. But we've been given the task of coming alongside people with the Word of God. Jesus is the answer. But we have to get close enough to people so that the questions that they're asking, they can see that Jesus is the answer. And we're there to give it to them. So there's lots of room for discouragement for us in our tough job. Nehemiah didn't ignore the problems. There's some wonderful things that we can learn here about how Nehemiah did it. Some of the problems in life are kind of like a flat tire. Even praying is not going to put the air back in it. You've got to go out and get the wrench and change the tire. And it seems like that's what Nehemiah did here. He got busy. He heard the cries of the people. He didn't just say, okay, you're right. 
This wasn't a really a good idea. Half a wall's way better than the last people that tried to do anything. I'm going back to be a cupbearer. See ya. He didn't do that. He started by unifying the efforts. He focused them. He got them thinking in families again. Verse 13 said, says that they got together by families. He stopped the work for a bit. He took some time off. There's a Greek saying that if you leave the bow tight, it'll break. You've got to loosen it off. And then it'll be strong when you need it. We know how that works. At least we know in theory that God didn't work for six days and there's a Sabbath idea. It's part of our, our, our teaching that you don't go all out all the time because you'll burn out and be broken. Nehemiah stopped the work for a little while to refocus. So he got them pulling together his families and resting up a bit, smartening, getting the, the job smarter. So often as a church, our, our efforts can get scattered. We've been going here or there. We don't know what the others are doing. And oftentimes that's the question. What is that other group doing? Is anybody, doing, anybody else besides me doing anything in this church? Well, obviously they are, but if you feel that way, then it just gets worse and worse. So what Nehemiah did in his situation, he unified them and got them understanding and he pulled them together. And we need to do that too. Understand what we're doing. Rest up a little bit, yes. And we have that system built into our, 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 the way we do things in this church. If you've been a member of a committee for a long time, it, it's written down that you should take a rest after a few years and things like that. So we want to follow that. But verse 14 is, uh, Nehemiah makes it very clear how to deal with discouragement. He says, remember the Lord. They were looking at the situation, all they saw was rubbish and and Nehemiah said, stop seeing that. Start seeing the, that the Lord is the, your guide and your strength. And he reminded them of who God is. So when, when, when discouragement comes, get out Psalm 37. <laughs> the don't worry, be happy Psalm. And it'll change you. Count your many blessings is another way of putting it. Trust in the Lord. Be calm. All those kinds of things that Psalm 37 says, God is watching over us. He is in control. And of all things, don't be afraid. I've often wanted, wanted to, to know how many people, I, I was thinking that if we could get a, bi a big hat to put on everybody with a gauge on it, and it would show how wide awake you are during the sermon and stuff, that would be kind of neat for me to see. And what would I do if I saw a whole bunch of the, the, all the way down? I would say, it's time for a responsive reading. And so, if we put that up, here it is. <laughs> but it's really on, on point, okay? Because we're, to deal with this discouragement, we need to be reminded, don't be afraid. And the wonders of computers will let you find all the don't be afraid things in the Bible, and then you can put them up like this. Okay, so this half, you're going to read the the... the the top of each slide, because you can't really tell that it's... Yeah, you can. The top one, you read the first one, and, the, and this half, you respond in the other side. And remember, when you come to don't be afraid, or uh, don't be, uh, do not be afraid, or whatever, say it a little bit louder in your voice, okay? So you folks start off, and, and say the verse, okay? Because it, 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 it'll sit in our minds clearer that this is the word of God. And lots of these are Jesus' own words for us. So this side, you ready to start? Don't ever be afraid or discouraged, Joshua told his men.
Wow. And you know, there was no, don't, do not be afraid from any angels in that, this list. Because you, every time an angel showed up, it's, he's, the angel said that too. So there's a lot, I, that's not all of them. There's tons of them. Clear instructions. Oh, I forgot. I was going to have to make sure that really worked about not getting tired and, and sleepy during the service. I was going to have you have to stand up when you read your thing. Aw. Uh, you want to do it again? <laughs> what a beautiful instruction. You know, we don't like commands, but that kind of command is just a beautiful one. And we need to take it into our hearts. We have no reason to be afraid. This isn't just a bossy God saying, would you do as you're told and don't be afraid? No, that's not how don't be afraid works. It's a reassurance. It's a building up. It's a reminder that we have nothing to fear. And therefore, we're no reason to be discouraged. Nehemiah also uh, went and, and balanced the thoughts and, with action. He, he said when his little speech about uh, fighting for your families, touching the emotions and saying, okay, this is worth, we're building the wall, we're defending it, but this really means we're defending our families. He put it in context. And I guess that's okay. We get a little confused over our motives or why we should do things for the Lord. Some of us, at some time or other, has, have heard a preacher get it across the idea that if we don't obey the Lord, we're going to cook. And when we die, we're going to spend eternity in hell. And that's a, not, a, not a bad motive, okay? I mean, to, to push for us. Let's do it as an insurance policy, okay? And, and, and that's not wrong, it's just not complete. When we understand the blessings that God gives us and the, what happens when he changes us so that we actually are loving to one another, not just ticking off the, that the job's done. I was loving to so-and-so today and, and, say, and say, give me my bonus point. No. We change to be more like Jesus when we practice what he asks us to do in being loving and kind to one another. So that balance of getting the job done and having it affect us is a beautiful thing. And that's what Nehemiah did. Is he, he got them to, to do the balance thing and, and get it done. And then he got to recognize the reality that the enemy, they weren't just talking. They had swords. They had soldiers. They had probably a reputation of following through when they say, we're going to come down and kill you that they probably could. So Nehemiah didn't say, hey, those guys are no good, they can't do that. No, he said, we need to be on guard. And what a beautiful idea. I mean, it showed pretty, pretty, pretty neat in the cartoon, eh? the, the people with the sword and the, and the trowel, and then others with the swords and stuff. This was real stuff. They had to be practical in their application of defense. What about us? One of Satan's best tools is to convince us that he doesn't exist. And he does that in so many different ways. And we live our lives thinking that, well, I got Jesus in my heart. And the, we know the battle's in the end is won. So I'm just going to carry on. Like the pastor said, don't be discouraged. Do the job. Well, there's another part of this. The Bible teaches very clearly that we're in a spiritual battle. And I, this is where I'd love to get and spend the next 40 minutes preaching on the full armor of God, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to remind you of in Galatians 6. It's just so clear that we're in a spiritual battle and we need to do kind of things that Nehemiah said. Make sure you got the trumpets ready to go to warn one another. So we need to be watching out for each other's back. You need to know who your brothers and sisters are in Christ. And when you see... Uh, them in problems, blow the trumpet. Get together and pray for these things. We need to have the armor of God, the sword of the, of the word, at our hands all the time. We need to have the word of God in our heart, ready to do battle against Satan. He's marching around, ready to devour. You know, marching around like a lion, ready to devour us. So, Nehemiah illustrated that balance. That was wonderful. 
And then he showed that you needed to work together. And this is a good, a good point for us too, that we can't do it alone. He talked about a rallying point, so when the trumpet goes, everybody knows to go to the, the, the one center so they can do a better battle and all that kind of stuff. In our Christian walk, this need for accountability, this need to, to do things together and not just go out on our own is so important. And in the life of a church, it's so important too. It's, of course, we get tired of too many committee meetings and, and all that kind of stuff and, and have to go... Th- you get a good idea, and then you think, oh, i got to check with so-and-so. i got to check with so Why can't I just do my good idea? It would be so much easier if I could just do it myself. Why do I have to check out with somebody else? Well, you can't build the wall. And one guy pre- couldn't just build the wall. He, the guys would come swoop down and kill him in Nehemiah's story. And in our story, so in our life, in our work that we're to do, the working together, is as clear a part of the work, they'll know we are Christians by our love for one another. So, we want to share the love of Jesus Christ with others, with people that don't know him yet, and they look over and they see a bunch of Lone Ranger types doing it all on their own. They might be getting the job sort of done, but they can't show any love for one another. So from our Nehemiah story, it's quite clear that, and from lots of other places in the Bible too, that we need to be working together. We can't do it alone. And do what alone? Well, the way we get to do that is show that we're not working alone is we serve one another. When Nehemiah's, the picture of Nehemiah and these people in this new phase of their work, almost humorous and almost sad. Do you know any tradespeople? You do. Can you imagine them? Well, and you know some soldiers. You do a mixed thing, and you take, a, you take the trowel and give it to the, the bricklayer, and then you say, here, hold this gun, too. You're just down to zero productivity in bricklaying and zero defense in, in military tactics, too. But here it worked. It works for us when it's God giving us the instructions. When we serve one another, we serve ourselves. We protect ourselves. That's the upside down part of Jesus' story. That when we serve and love others, we ourselves grow spiritually. So, find somebody to serve and you'll be getting your job done a whole lot better. We need to get involved with other people's lives. So our story of Nehemiah continues. Our challenge for us, I hope, continues to sharpen. The word today of, of recognizing that we get discouraged. It could be the weather. It could be lots of things. But in our spiritual walk with God, we need to lift one another up. We need to be there with a smile. We need to be there to encourage and lift, help one another get through this so that we become effective for the Lord. Don't get down, just get busy. Nehemiah had to get rid of the blahs in his camp, in his work camp, or the work would have been done. What wonderful techniques. Go over the story again I, as we looked at it and read this and, and, and be thrilled by how God gave Nehemiah such wisdom. I want to end with, uh, just go over this wonderful passage from Philippians. I don't know if you can see it very good, but it goes like this. Don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. And then, before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good, will come and settle you down It's wonderful what happens, and I need to see the last line. (laughs) It's wonderful what happens. It's going to come, even though we have to go through the whole thing. If not, keep pumping the button there, Aaron. There we go. Don't fret there. Right down at the bottom. 
It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. That's why we can talk about great and awesome blues. Because it's wonderful when Christ takes over and replaces all those worries and all those fears. Let's celebrate that. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for the clear instructions and the wonderful illustrations that come from the life of Nehemiah. And thank you, Lord, for the opportunities we have to be encouraging to one another, to be encouraged by your word, to be encouraged by you saying to us, do not be afraid. Trust in me. So, Lord, give us lots of opportunities to remember you and your glorious strength day by day this week. Thank you, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, amen.